الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء وإمام المرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقائدنا وقرة عيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين وأصحابه الغل ميامين أفضل الصلاة والتم والتسليم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته after praising Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala and sending salutations upon our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam will proceed. And alhamdulillah rabbil alameen that Allah Azza wa has gathered us in his home, in his masjid. Worshipping him jalla wa ala, seeking beneficial knowledge, getting closer to him jalla wa ala. And these are gatherings where Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala sends down his mercy and his tranquility and he jalla wa ala his angels they surround these people who gather in these gatherings and Allah Taala he mentions those who come to these gatherings in the heavens amongst the angels and he praises them tabaraka wa ta'ala it's a great honor that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala has chosen us to come to his house seeking the pleasure of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala and this is what we need to remind ourselves of all the time when we come to these gatherings that element of al-ikhlas, sincerity, that I'm doing it for Allah, wa ta'ala, seeking the pleasure of Allah, wa ta'ala, in order to get the reward of Allah, Azza wa Jal, because this dunya is fani, and this world is going to come to an end, and what matters, it is the akhirah, the home of the hereafter that we're all going to. So we always remind ourselves, because al-ikhlas, sincerity, it is something that we need to remind, be reminded of all the times. When the great ulama of the past, like Sufyan al-Thawri, are saying, مَا عَالَجْتُ شَيْئًا أَشَدَّ عَلَيَّ مِنْ نِيَّةِ لِأَنَّهَا تَتَقَلَّبُ عَلَيْهِ That I have not tried to treat anything more difficult than my intention because it constantly flips on me. Yani it's a constant battle. But that's a battle that the believer is aware of. The moment we are unaware, that is when things go wrong. So we need to remind ourselves of that. And you always ask Allah to go on to... Sincerity. We ask Allah to grant us sincerity and to accept our deeds. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilman wa amalan ya rabbil alameen. Ayyuhu al-ikhwa, last week we covered a number of things from the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. We mentioned what the seerah it is. Linguistically it means a tariqa, a path, right? And we said that technically it means the life and the biography of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam from his birth until his death. And we covered the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam up to Ibrahim alayhi salam and we said up to Adnan who is from the offspring of Ismail that's agreed upon. Between Adnan and Ismail is differed upon. And we also mentioned the birth of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam that he was born on the year of the elephant in the month of Rabi al-Awwal Rabi al-Awwal and also on a Monday, as for the exact date that's a different upon, we don't know exactly what date it was. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were a number of signs that we mentioned that were present that indicated that he was going to be great and he was going to have a great future. Like the dream of his mother that she saw light came out of her that lit up the palaces of Asham. And he also, Alayhi Salatu Salam, told us that he is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam was that Allah he sends amongst the people of Mecca a messenger who is going to recite the speech of Allah azza wa jal and teach them and purify them and that is the messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. And he also said that I'm the glad tidings of Isa alayhi salam who gave glad tidings to his people that there's a messenger coming after him and his name is Ahmed as Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Saf. And we also went through the Prophet ﷺ, that he was breastfed by Halim al Sa'diya, and we mentioned before that he was breastfed by Thuwayba, who was the slave woman of Abu Lahab. And then we mentioned that he went to the Badia, the countryside with Halim al Sa'diya, where he spent a number of years, up to the age of four. And he spent time there, and Halim al Sa'diya, she mentions that when the Prophet ﷺ came into her life, that transformed her life. It granted her a lot of barakah in herself, in her family, in her wealth, and so on. And then we mentioned the incident of the chest of the Prophet ﷺ being opened and his heart being purified and the clot being taken out of his heart, which is a portion of shaitan in his heart, and his heart being washed with zamzam. And we mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ was brought back to his mother after that, and he spent two years with his mother, and then his mother died in a place known as Al-Abwa. 
And we mentioned that after that, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, took him in and he took care of him for two years until the age of, the age of eight. And then he passed away and he advised his son, Abu Talib, to take care of the Prophet, We mentioned at the age of 12, the Prophet, he went with his uncle, Abu Talib, to Asham, to Syria, for business. And then he meant that monk, that Christian monk, whose name was Buhaira al-Rahib, or his name was Jirjis, we mentioned. And he saw the signs of the Prophet والسلام, and then he told Abu Talib to take him back to Mecca because he was afraid the Romans were going to harm him or he was afraid that the Jews were going to harm him in the, in the different narrations. And then the Prophet والسلام, we mentioned that he took part, not physically, but he took part in the war that happened in Mecca between Quraysh and the tribes in Taif, which was known as Harbul Fijar. I mispronounced it, pronounced it last week. I said Harbul Fujar. It is Harbul Fijar. Harbul Fijar, which happened in Mecca, and the Prophet ﷺ was 15 years old, and he was preparing the arrows for his uncles, and he was trained in warfare by his uncles, Ali ﷺ. And then we mentioned Hilful Fudul, the treaty that happened between the tribes of Quraysh, that they're going to support and aid anyone who's oppressed against their oppressor. And that is where we stop. Today, inshaAllah ta'ala, we get to the stage where the Prophet ﷺ, we also mentioned the Prophet ﷺ working, and he was a shepherd. I mentioned that also last week. We get to the stage now that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he gets into business, which he was familiar with because he accompanies uncles and his other relatives on business trips to Sham previously. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was employed by Khadija bint Khuwaylid. Khadija bint Khuwaylid, she was a widow. Khadija bint Khuwaylid, she was a widow. She was married to two men previously, and they both died. Her first husband, he was known as Atiq ibn Aid. That was her first husband. Atiq ibn Aid. Her second husband was Abu Hala. These were the two husbands that married Khadija bint Khuwaylid, radiyallahu anha, before the Prophet so both of her husbands died. So she inherited a lot of wealth from her husband. She inherited a lot of wealth from her husband when he died. So Khadija radiallahu anha wa ardaha, she was an extremely intelligent woman. And she was known amongst Quraysh as At-Tahir, the pure woman. And she had she was one of the most noble women of Quraysh and the one of the most beautiful women of Quraysh. Every single man wanted to marry her. She would have many suitors coming, seeking her hand in marriage, and she would refuse. It is said that Khadija, radiallahu anha, that she saw a dream that it, the sun had risen in her home. She saw that dream. And this was indication that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa was going to marry her. So Khadija, radiallahu anha, she was intelligent because the wealth that she inherited from her husband, she used it for business. But this is a point that needs to be pointed out. That a lot of people, they misunderstand Khadija radiallahu anha being a businesswoman. They think that Khadija radiallahu anha, she actually worked and she went and she went on business trips and so on. No. Khadija radiallahu anha, she employed men to work for her, to do business on her behalf. She would do something known as mudaraba that she would give them the wealth, whatever profit they bring back, she would give them a portion of that wealth, of the profit. So the Prophet ﷺ was employed by Khadija. And he وسلم, she sent him to Asham, Syria, with her slave who was called Maysara. So the Prophet ﷺ, Maysara, they went out to Asham, Syria. And the Prophet ﷺ traded on the behalf of Khadija. And this was one of the most profitable times of Khadija's business. There was a lot of barakah in her business that she showed because of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And Maysara, who accompanied the Prophet alayhi salatu salam in Asham, they got to a city known as Busra. Now, do you remember this city? Where is the city? That's Basra. This is Busra. I mentioned it last week. Where is it? In Syria, it's not Basra in Iraq, it's Busra in Syria. Who did the Prophet ﷺ meet in Bus Busra last time? The monk, Buhaira, right? 
Again, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he goes to Busra and he sits under a tree near a ma'bad, the place there where the Christians used to worship, the monks. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam sits under a specific tree. There was a monk who was in that ma'bad who saw the Prophet alayhi salatu sitting under that tree. So then he called Maysara. He said, who is that man? Maysara said, this is Muhammad. He's from the Haram, from Mecca. He said, the monk is saying, Ma jalasa tahta hadihi shajara illa nabi. He said, no one has sat under this tree except a prophet. So both times the Prophet ﷺ went to Syria, there were the people of the scripture who saw him, who were aware of his description because they had it in their scriptures, and they knew that the Prophet ﷺ was coming and they were awaiting him. This monkey said to Maysara after that, that we have been told in our scriptures that there is a prophet coming and this is his time. And we believe that he's going to be from the Arabs. That's what he said. So the people of the scriptures, they were certain that the Prophet is coming. But they refused to believe due to other factors. So the Prophet came back to Mecca. And he brought back the wife of Khadija radiallahu anha with a lot of prophets. And the Prophet was entitled to take his portion of that prophet before he gave it to Khadija. But he sallallahu alayhi wa came back and he brought all the wealth to Khadija radiallahu anha. And then after he brought it all to Khadija, then Khadija radiallahu anha, she gave his portion to him alayhi salatu salam. And she was amazed by his trustworthiness and his truthfulness and the barakah that was in her wealth. And Maysara, he told Khadija radiallahu anha about all the things that he witnessed when the Prophet alayhi salatu went to Sham. Because even the clouds were shading him. The trees that he sat under. He told her about the incident of the monk that he met and what he told him. All these matters. So Khadija radiallahu anha, when she heard about this, this changed her perspective on the Prophet alayhi salatu. She already knew him as a trustworthy one, the truthful one and so on. But now she realized there was something else that was special about this man. So Khadija radiallahu anha wardaha, what did she do? She decided that this is a man that I want to marry. Look at the intelligence. It's an opportunity that came to her. She didn't waste the opportunity. She seized it immediately because she realized that you don't get a man like that often. So she spoke to her friend Nafisa. And this teaches us that there's nothing wrong with the woman having Yani the intention to marry a man and also doing something about it. But look at the way Khadija radiallahu anha she dealt with it. Because she lives in a society which is similar to some of our cultures today, where a woman approaching a man for marriage, it's something that's looked down upon or is, is difficult, right? So therefore, what did she do? She sent her friend Nafisa. Nafisa, she says that she went to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Now, she didn't mention Khadija at all. She went to him and she said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Muhammad, what do you think about getting married? She suggested the idea of marriage. So the uh, Prophet Alaihi Wasallam uh, uh, said, how can I get married when I don't have any wealth at the moment? And I'm not wealthy. I don't have enough. Then she said to him, what about if you didn't have to worry about the element of wealth? Then he said, of course I'm interested in getting married, that, if that's the case. This is the only thing stopping me. And then he, sallallahu, and then she said to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that, so what do you think about Khadija? Now, she didn't say to him that Khadija had sent her. She didn't she give didn't him give an idea of that. She said, what do you think of Khadija? And then he said, who can have someone like Khadija? Yani Khadija was a woman that all the men were fighting over. Who can get someone like Khadija? And then she said, let me go speak to her. Uh, she said, let me go speak to her. Perhaps she may accept. So the Prophet ﷺ said very well. And he went to his uncles and he consulted his uncles about marrying Khadija. And his uncles, they all were happy. And they went to seek Khadija radiallahu anha's hand in marriage. His uncles all went with him. Who did they go to? Now Khadija... She, uh, her father had passed away in the correct narration. There are some narrations that mention that her father, Khuwailid ibn Asad, he was alive. And 
the Prophet alayhi salatu proposed to Khadija and went to her father. And the narration, it says, now I'm going to tell you this narration is weak, it's not true. But this is what some of the books of history mention. They mention that he went to Khuwaylid and he proposed to him and Khuwaylid rejected the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. He said, how can you marry the orphan of uh, Bani Abdul Muttalib? Right? So in the Khadija, it says, the narration says, that Khadija was adamant in marrying the Prophet alayhi salatu So she gathered her father and some of her relatives and they came into the house and then she served wine to them and they drank and they drank until they got really drunk and there were certain clothes that they used to give their parents when they're getting married and then she said to him marry me to Muhammad and then he married her to the Prophet alayhi salatu and whilst he was drunk and then when he woke up he saw his, when he regained and he, and he became sober and he was able to understand what was going on he saw he was wearing these garments that he would only wear when a wedding occurs. So he said, what's happened? And then it is said that she said to him, right, that you married me to Muhammad. And then he said, no way that I've done that. She said, are you going to go out to Quraysh and say that you married me to Muhammad whilst you're drunk and they all go to shame you and say that you're foolish and an idiot? Right? So that narration they mention in some of the books of Sira, it's fake, it's fabricated. Rather, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he went to her uncle because Khuwaylid, what is correct is that he didn't actually, he wasn't alive when the Prophet was married Khadija. He died before Harb al Fijar. He wasn't even alive. So his story, that whole narration, it shows that it's absolute fabrication. The guy wasn't even alive. So they approached her uncle. His name was Amr ibn Asad. They went to him and they asked for Khadija's hand in marriage. Now, it is said that Abu Talib, he's the one who proposed on behalf of the Prophet alayhi salatu And Amr accepted that proposal. And the Prophet alayhi salatu he got married to Khadija. Now, how much was the mahar of the Prophet alayhi salatu the dowry that he gave to Khadija? Anyone know? Uh, anyone know? The dowry that the Prophet alayhi salatu he gave to Khadija radiallahu anha was 12 awqiyah, which is what in, we will, in pounds, let's try to put it in pounds, it's around 800 pounds today. 800 pounds. And that's the, the same dowry that he gave to every single one of his wives. Every single one of his wives, it was the same amount. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he told us that the less you give, or the less that's demanded, or requested, the more barakah that marriage will have. That's what he said, alayhi salatu wasallam. So the Prophet Ali Salat, he set the example for us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Muf- Ibn Qayyim Rahimahullah he says that the dowry of the Prophet Ali Salat Salam, it is the most balanced dowry. It's the most balanced dowry, it's the best example to follow. If only our sisters can hear. One time I was conducting a nikah, right? I hope that brother's not here. And uh, on the contract, I asked how much is the mahar. I was told that the mahar is 80,000 pounds. I said, yeah, Sheikh, 80,000 pounds, what are you buying? And then they said, no, no, this is how we do it. On the actual day, we negotiate. So we, he, I told him, okay, so do I write down 80,000 pounds on the contract or not? He said, no, don't write anything yet. They said, there's a guy coming, he's our negotiator. So he came, and then they started speaking in their language, right? I have no idea what's going on. Then all of a sudden, I hear 50,000. I said, do I write down 50,000 now? I said, no, they said to me, no, wait, wait. Then they started speaking again for a few more minutes, and they tell me 40,000. And I said, okay, do I write that down? They said, no, we'll try one more try. And then... They told me, no, no, it's 40,000, that's fine, khalas. as
It is Abdullah. And he has a nickname known as At-Tayyib at tahir The pure one. The reason why Abdullah has that nickname, it is because he was born after prophethood. So he was born in that pure period of prophethood. Abdullah also died very young. He died very young. And then the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ, you have Zainab, who is the eldest of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. And you have Ruqayyah. And you have Umm Kalthum. And you have Fatima. These are the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. All of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ, they lived until prophethood and they all embraced Islam. But all of them died in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ except Fatima. Fatima died six months after the Prophet ﷺ. Which shows you that the Prophet ﷺ, he went through the difficulty of losing both of his parents in his lifetime and also losing all of his children except one. Because the Prophet ﷺ had another son from Mary al Qibtiyah. And he had a son called Ibrahim from her. And Ibrahim also died as a young child in the lifetime of the Prophet. ﷺ. He buried him himself. ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ, he went through the bitter experience of losing both parents. And also the bitter experience of losing all his children except one. And this is a lesson that Allah Ta'ala, he is. Preparing the Prophet ﷺ for prophethood and to be a leader. Because a leader who has gone through a lot of grief and gone through hardship will never be an arrogant or a boastful or a tyrant in his leadership. Rather, he'll be compassionate, merciful, and one who assists people and cares about them. Because of the difficulty that he went through, he can relate to others. And that's exactly what Allah was preparing the Prophet ﷺ for. Also, the death of all the sons of the Prophet ﷺ in his lifetime, there's another lesson in it and benefit. The first benefit, it is that the Prophet ﷺ, he was granted sons so that he is complete like all the other men because men desired the most in that society were boys, were sons. So he was granted that so that he had what other men had, he didn't have anything less than them. He was complete in that sense. But Allah took all his sons in his lifetime so that it doesn't cause fitna. Because if his sons were to live, Allah did not want the other people, the Arabs, to say that these sons of the Prophet ﷺ, that they are infallible, that they have parts of prophethood, that they are also prophets and messengers of Allah. So Allah was protecting the message of the Messenger ﷺ from that. So he took all their lives in his lifetime. ﷺ. Whereas his daughters lived and they got married. ﷺ. We also learn from the this story of the incident of Khadija radiallahu anha that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, his trustworthiness and his truthfulness, it is what made his business profitable. It is what made the business profitable. Trustworthiness and truthfulness. And Allah wa ta'ala puts more barakah in a business the more truthful you are and the more trustworthy you are. But the more you are deceiving others or cheating others and you are dealing with people in a yani, with deception and so on tricking them then Allah takes the barakah out of that business honesty also we learn that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam he was a businessman and business is something that's extremely encouraged in Islam that a Muslim he gets involved in business that he works for himself he doesn't work for others the Prophet ﷺ, he is teaching us that to free yourself from the shackles of employment to others and be one who is self-employed, he works for himself because that gives you the opportunity to fulfill your rights to Allah without anyone dictating to you. Brothers, they come to us and they say that, you know, I find it difficult to pray at work. I find it difficult to go to Salat al-Jumu'ah. I find it difficult to do this and that and that because of work. 
work is getting between, in between you and your purpose of life. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching us that this is the way out of it. That you provide for yourself without having to answer to anyone. And that has more barakah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that التاجر الصدوق الأمين في هذا الدين يحشر مع الصديقين والشهداء والنبيين The Prophet ﷺ, he said that the businessman who is honest and truthful and trustworthy in this religion who is a Muslim يعني, he shall be resurrected يوم القيامة with the truthful and the martyrs and the prophets encouraging one to be a truthful honest businessman Islam encourages that and it teaches us that's barakah and the Prophet ﷺ, he said اليد العليا خير من اليد السفلى that the hand that gives is better than the hand that takes. Right? So it, Islam encourages that one he earns and he also gives for the sake of Allah ta'ala and he benefits others with that wealth that he has accumulated. And if you notice something that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they learned that from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam and the majority of the companions were businessmen. Out of the ten that are promised paradise, eight of them were successful businessmen, extremely wealthy. Because they saw that from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. We also learn from the story of the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Khadija that the importance of marrying a woman who is going to support you and aid you in your responsibilities and your duty as a man. Marrying a woman who understands that. Khadija radiallahu anha, she was an extremely intelligent woman. And she understood exactly what the Prophet ﷺ needed. And how old was Khadija radiallahu anha when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her? How old was she? Huh? She was 40, huh? 40. Marra wa hadi kida? 40? Sorry? 28. Uh, any other answers? So we have 40, we have 28. Any other answers? Sorry? 40. No other answers are 40 and 28. That's all you have. 45. Oh, you've gone up. Huh? 26, 29. Ah, interesting. Huh? 41. Wow. Tayyib, what about if I told you that we don't know how old she was? We, all we know is that she was older than the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, but there's, no, there's not an exact narration that specifies how old Khadija radiallahu anha was when the Prophet alayhi salam married her. And the narration that says she's 40, it's a weak narration. Or some of them are fabricated. Some of them have no chains. So the ulama, they say, when they look at the life of the Prophet Ali from Khadija, they say that she was approximately perhaps 30 or 29. Five years older than the Prophet Ali when he married her. He was 25 when he married her. Right? Because if we say that Khadija radiallahu anha was 40, when you're 40, it's difficult to have six children, isn't it? It's difficult to have six children once you reach the age of 40. It's not common. Right? So that also indicates that Khadija radiallahu anha had six children with the Prophet alayhi salatu that she was younger than 40. Right? Now. طيب. Uh, also from the benefits that we take from this, it is that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he married Khadija radiallahu anha and Khadija radiallahu anha was older than the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And normally, the, a man, he tends to marry a woman who is a similar age to him or perhaps younger than him. That was the, the norm, right? So you find that some of the Orientalists and some of the disbelievers, they try to make accusations against the Prophet والسلام, and they say that the Prophet والسلام, he married a lot of women because of desires and so on. Because of all the other women that the Prophet has married. طيب, let's have a look at this. And this will show you whether this accusation is true or false. The Prophet Sallallahu he married Khadija at the age of 25. Khadija was older than him. A man who thinks about desires when he's marrying a, marry a woman, he doesn't marry a woman who's older than him generally. That's number one. Secondly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he was married to Khadija for 25 years. He never looked at another woman. He never married another woman with her. When did he, the Prophet Sallallahu marry all these other women? After the age of 50, when he got to 50 years old, normally a man thinks about marrying again or marrying other women between the age of 25 to 40. Once he's past 40, he doesn't really have that desire to marry more women. The Prophet Alayhi married Aisha and Sauda and all the other Ummahat al after the age of 50. 
indicating that it wasn't a matter of desire. There's other hikam wisdoms that was behind every single marriage which we're going to come to, inshallah ta'ala, when we get to the marriage of the Prophet alayhi salam to other wives. Every single marriage had a purpose and a wisdom. Now, the Prophet alayhi salam also, all of his wives after Khadija were, they were either widows or divorcees. Only Aisha radiallahu anha was a virgin. What does that indicate? If the Prophet ﷺ was thinking about desire and so on, normally he would go for a virgin and only marry virgins. The Prophet ﷺ, when he married Sauda bint Zam'ah radiallahu anha, who was the first wife he married after Khadija, he married her when he was 50 years old. And how old was Sauda? She was 55 years old and she had children. All that debunks the idea that the Prophet ﷺ married a lot of women because of desire and so on. Rather, Allah Ta'ala had a wisdom behind every single marriage, and Allah Ta'ala inspired and instructed the Prophet Ali to marry a lot of these women. Some of them through wahi, through them, some of them through inspiration, ilham, and so on. Right? No. So the Prophet Ali he never married another woman with Khadija. And Khadija was the most beloved wife to the Prophet Ali The most beloved. He sallallahu alayhi wa he loved her extremely to the extent that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam even after her death he never ever forgot her he would constantly mention her Aisha radiallahu anha she said that look Aisha is the youngest wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam she is the most beloved to him from his other wives right she says that I have never ever this is her exact words she says ma ghirtu min ahadin ma ghirtu min Khadija bint Khuwaylid she says, I have never ever felt jealousy towards someone like I have because of Khadija bin Tukhwilid. And I have never even met her. That's what she says. But because of how much the Prophet ﷺ would mention her, that I would become jealous of her. And she's passed away years ago. She says, radiallahu anha, Aisha, that Hala bin Tukhwilid, who is a sister of Khadija, would come to our house to seek permission to enter. And the Prophet ﷺ would recognize her voice because her voice was very similar to Khadija's. And the Prophet ﷺ would become extremely happy. He would say, Allahumma hala. And then she would enter and they would talk about Khadija and remember Khadija radiallahu anha. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that again, I felt jealousy. And then this time she actually spoke up and she spoke to the Prophet ﷺ. She said, Ya Rasulullah, why is it that you keep mentioning this toothless old woman who's dead? Hasan Allah Ta'ala replaced her with something better than her? And then he said, Allah he said, No. Aisha's mouth dropped. And then he said, Allah he didn't stop there. He said that she believed in me when no one believed in me. She supported me when no one supported me. And Allah Ta'ala granted me children from her. And then Aisha says, Wakada, Wakada, Wakada. And he said that and that and that. She doesn't want to repeat the rest of it because she doesn't want to say it. Because of the jealousy that she felt. That is the position that Khadija radiallahu anha she had. When Khadija radiallahu anha she died, and we're going to come to it inshallah ta'ala on the 10th year after prophethood. When she died, the Prophet ﷺ, he felt a lot of grief and a lot of sadness. And after her death, people would come to the Prophet ﷺ and suggest the idea of marriage to him. And every time they would suggest the idea of marriage to him, his response was, I mean, ba'di Khadija. After Khadija, how can I get married after Khadija? And then they'll give him time. They will suggest the idea again. And he will say, I mean, ba'di Khadija. After Khadija, how can I get married after Khadija? He will say, Inni ruziqtu hubbaha. The love of Khadija is embedded in me. It's a part of me. It is said that the Prophet ﷺ, after the battle of Badr, that there were prisoners taken from Quraysh. And amongst these prisoners was a man known as Abu al-As ibn Rabi'a. Abu al-As ibn Rabi'a, he was the husband of the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Zainab. Abu al-As was a mushrik at the time. So he was taken as a prisoner and Zainab radiallahu anha, she heard that she had to ransom her husband. So she sent a necklace to ransom her husband. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam, this necklace was brought to him in order for Abu al-As to be freed. The Prophet alayhi salatu he looked at the necklace and then he took a moment and he went silent. And then he sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he started to cry. And then he said to the sahaba, give back to them their necklace and their prisoner. Why did he وسلم, cry? This was a necklace that Khadija radiallahu anha, she gifted to Zainab when she got married. He remembered Khadija radiallahu anha. This is the 
connection the Prophet ﷺ, he had with Khadija, and that didn't take anything away from his manhood and his leadership and him being a messenger. Right? This is the rahmah that a man truly has for his wife and his family, his children, and so on. It doesn't mean that being a man is that one who is completely has jafa. He has no mercy, no rahmah, no compassion, no care for others. لا. The Prophet ﷺ was the rahmah lil alameen. Moving on. The Prophet ﷺ, when he got to the age of 35, he said, Allah ﷺ, he took part in rebuilding the Kaaba. Now the Kaaba, what happened was there was an extreme flood that happened in Mecca. And this flood, it caused the Kaaba, parts of it to start crumbling. So Quraysh, they decided that we're going to renovate or rebuild the Kaaba. But they were afraid. They were afraid of demolishing the Kaaba. They thought that if we demolish the Kaaba, the wrath of Allah and the anger of Allah and the curse of Allah and the punishment of Allah, punishment of Allah is going to strike us immediately. Quraysh had that fear. So Al-Walid al Mughira, who was one of the leaders of Quraysh, he said, I'm going to start demolishing the Kaaba. I'm going to start demolishing parts of it. That's what he said. And then he said that if something happens, then you know we need to stop. Something happens to me. Then, if something doesn't happen to me, then we can continue. So he started, he demolished a part of the Kaaba, and then he left it. And the rest of Quraysh are terrified. No one is touching it. Everyone's keeping a distance from Al Mughira. Okay? Al Walid Al Mughira. They're all keeping a distance from him. And they waited until the next day to see if something happened to him. When they realized nothing happened to him, they all came and they demolished the Kaaba. Right? They realized that Allah is pleased with this. Right? So they demolished the Kaaba, and they agreed that they are going to only use wealth that is pure to rebuild the Kaaba. All the wealth that they gathered was only pure wealth. They said that there's going to be no money that's from riba used to rebuild the Kaaba. No money from gambling. No money that was stolen. Nothing that came from haram. Look at Quraysh. Kuffar. Who are differentiating between haram and halal. And you find a Muslim who doesn't care about the haram and halal wealth that he has. And he uses haram wealth for things that are virtuous. If mushrikeen are doing that, where is the Muslim who fears Allah, who believes in Allah, who worships Allah, where is he meant to be in that equation? Mushrikeen who are associating partners with Allah, doing the worst of sin, shirk billah, they care about what they use to rebuild the house of Allah. Mm. It's a question. So, when the next day they came, they started to rebuild the Kaaba. And the Prophet والسلام, and his uncle Abbas and Abdul Muttalib, they took part in carrying the stones that was being used to rebuild the Kaaba and he took part in it now there was an incident that when they were carrying the stones his uncle Abbas he said to the Prophet place your izar he said to the Prophet place your izar the izar it is the lower garment the lower garment he told him place your izar on your neck so that it can help you carry the the rocks so that it doesn't harm your back or your neck so the Prophet ﷺ intended to do that to lift up his izar. And as he intended to do so, he fell unconscious. And his eyes looked up to the heavens. And then when he regained consciousness, he said, Izari, Izari, my lower garment, my lower garment. And Allah sent, or he made it that his lower garment was tightened on his waist. Why? So that the awr of the Prophet ﷺ would not be exposed. Allah Ta'ala protecting his Prophet Sallallahu from even his awrah being exposed to others. Right? So that happened and the, and the hadith it says that the awrah of the Prophet Sallallahu would never expose after that. Even though it never became exposed in that time. But it means that it never happened after that. Now, so then after they built the Kaaba, Quraysh, they didn't have enough money, any halal money, to rebuild the Kaaba the way it was. The Kaaba was a rectangle initially. But they built it the way it is today. Now it's a square, isn't it? A cube. And then it has outside the Kaaba, if you notice, there's this semicircle outside the Kaaba, right? That part is part of the Kaaba. Initially, it was part of the Kaaba. Quraysh put it there to indicate that this part of the Kaaba is called the Hijr, right? The Kaaba that we have today, by the way, Quraysh never built it. We're going to get to how many times the Kaaba was built and what happened to it. But the, the way it's built today is the way Quraysh built it, okay? So, when they built the Kaaba, now Quraysh, they had a huge dispute. 
And this dispute was regarding who's going to have the honor, which clan is going to have the honor of placing the black stone into the Kaaba. The black stone is a stone that came down from Jannah. It used to be as white as milk. It became black due to the sins of the people. So they wanted, every single clan wanted to get the honor of placing the black stone into the Kaaba. So they were almost about to fight one another. It was going to lead to bloodshed. They were literally going to raise their swords and kill each other because of this. That's how bad it got. It escalated quickly. It went from 100, 1 to 0 quickly. Or 0 to 100 quickly, I should say. Huh? And then they said, one of the elders amongst them said, that, calm down. Rather, the next man that walks through that door, we are going to allow him to judge between us to give us a suggestion of what to do. So that man happened to be the Prophet alayhi salatu He walked through the door. And as soon as he walked through, he walked through the door, you know, they all said, هَذَا Muhammad, هَذَا الصَّادِقُ الْأَمِينَ رَضِيْنَا بِهِ رَضِيْنَا بِهِ They said, this is Muhammad. This is the truthful one, the honest one, the trustworthy one. We are pleased with him, we are content with him, we accept him as a judge. So the Prophet alayhi salatu he told them the following, that every single leader or representative of each clan, he get, they get a cloth and they grab the edges of each of the cloth and they place a black stone in that cloth and they carry it all together to the Kaaba and then they take it towards the Kaaba. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu he was the one who had the honors of placing the black stone with his own hands into the Kaaba. Everyone accepted that, was happy with that. This now teaches us a number of things. <clears throat> it teaches us that the Kaaba was built a number of times. Four times in history, the Kaaba was built. Built and rebuilt. The first time it was built by, of course, Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son Ismail. And they built it as a rectangle, as I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and the second time, it is the time now Quraysh built it, which we just mentioned before, prophethood. Qabl al The third time, it is during the Umayyad dynasty, during the Khilafah of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. During the time Yazid ibn Muawiyah, there was a dispute between the Khalifa at the time, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, and the Sahabi Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu was in Mecca. So Yazid ibn Muawiyah sent an army to surround Mecca and to see, to perform a siege around Mecca. No one can get in, no one can get out. And what did they do? That general, he catapulted the Kaaba. And parts of the Kaaba actually fell apart. So in that time, they rebuilt the Kaaba. That is the third time. And the fourth time, the last time, it is during the Khilafah of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, which is also in, during the Umayyad dynasty, Bani Umayyah. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he also had a dispute with Abdullah ibn Zubair. Radiyallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Zubair is in Mecca. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan is in Asham. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan sent a tyrant, an evil tyrant known as Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqidi was a bloodthirsty monster. A bloodthirsty monster. It is said that he killed in his lifetime 72,000 people. Others say more than that. Some of them say half a million. Others say that he killed 700,000. Just this man was not normal. Right? In his lifetime, he killed that many people. Imagine all those people come Yom Al-Qiyamah asking for their rights back. Where is Al-Hajjaj going to go? So Al-Hajjaj, he was sent by Abdul Malik Marwan to kill Abdullah ibn Zubair. So what did he do? He also surrounded Mecca and he catapulted the Kaaba as well. And Abdul Malik Marwan, in response to that, he said, he said, Allah'natu ala ibn Yusuf. He said, may the curse of Allah be upon ibn Yusuf, yani Hajjaj. He brought our shame upon Bani Umayyah. Now all the people are going to say that during the time of Bani Umayyah, the Kaaba was catapulted, especially during my time, Abdul Malik. So then Abdul Malik Marwan, he rebuilt the Kaaba after that incident. Now, these are the four times that the Kaaba was built. The first time was built by who? Ibrahim. Second time was built by who? Quraysh, before Prophet. Third time was built by who? Huh? Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Fourth time was built by who? Abdul Malik Marwan. These are the four times that the Kaaba was, was built. We also learn from this incident with the rebuilding the Kaaba. The Prophet, his trustworthiness and his honesty, it saved Quraysh from a disaster. 
it saved, it saved them from a blood bath because of the honesty and the trustworthiness of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Not only that, but Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, he blessed the messenger alayhi salatu salam, even before prophethood with the ability to solve problems instantly and quickly and to think quickly on the spot. He came up with a solution immediately. And this is a quality that he required for prophethood. Because you see that in his, in his time as the Prophet والسلام, that people will come to him with issues and problems and he will solve it for them instantly والسلام, or he would wait for wahi revelation from Allah وتعالى, if he required it. Now, also this teaches us that this incident of Ribbud and Kaaba it shows us the status the Prophet والسلام, he had amongst his people. That every single one of his people, they were content with the Prophet ﷺ being their judge because they knew how honest he was, how trustworthy he was, right? And that's why I, when I speak to a non-Muslim, if a non-Muslim says that, how can you prove to me that Muhammad ﷺ, he's the messenger of Allah, right? You know, the answer is, if you deny that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of Allah and he's a prophet of Allah, then you deny your mother is your mother. How, how, where, where are they connected, these two things? How do you know your mom's your mom? How do you know your mother's your mother? Huh? Because she told you. Huh? That's all you have, huh? Your mother told you she's your mother. That's all you know. That's all you have. Huh? <laughs> well, that's a different matter. <laughs> but your mother told you that she's your mother, huh? That's all you have. Or people told you that she's your mother. Sah, that's all you have. Tayyib, imagine we have narrations that are multitude narrations, and these are narrations that are, yeah, I mean, it's impossible for him to deny. If he's denying that these narrations are, are, are true, then he's denying his mother is his mother. That are saying the Prophet is a truth, truthful one, the trustworthy one. And all of his enemies are also saying that. Even after Islam, his enemies, Abu Sufyan, when he went to the Romans and they asked him about the Prophet, he said the same thing. When they're foes, he said he's trustworthy, he's truthful at all times. So one who no one's ever mentioned him lying, why would he all of a sudden lie about something so great like prophethood and the message of Allah? It makes no sense. What? Now, the Jameel, so that's uh, the rebuilding the Kaaba. Now we, we move on to the next stage. The next stage, it is that the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam, and we mentioned this previously, but I'm going to reiterate it. The Prophet Ali Salatu Salam, before his prophethood, there were glad tidings given to the people of the scriptures and the different religions that preceded, or the different people who preceded the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam, of the coming of the Messenger Ali Salatu by name. Do you know that the Prophet Ali was mentioned in the Torah and the Injil by name? But the Christians and Jews, they changed that and they distorted it because they didn't want it to people to find out. Well, the ulama, they mentioned, the scholars, they mentioned that the Prophet Ali he's mentioned in a specific type of the Injil, the Bible. And the Christians in the 5th century after Isa Ali salam's death, they prevented it from being spread. The church stopped it. Right? And from the incidents, the stories that we have that indicate that is a story of Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, he was in search of the true religion. So he traveled from Persia searching for the true religion. He went to different lands. And he met the people of the scripture, the Jews and the Christians. And one of the people that he met was a Christian monk, priest you can say. Right? So this Christian monk when he was about to die, he told Salman radiallahu anhu about the true religion. He said that you are, O Salman, in a time where there's a prophet coming with the true religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's going to be in the land of the Arabs. And he's going to migrate to a land that's between Harratain and Medina, which is filled with the date trees, the palm trees. And he has certain signs that indicate that this is truly him. He said, number one, he accepts gifts and he eats it, but he does not eat and accept charity. He has the seal of prophethood on his shoulders, between his shoulders, and it's on his left side. Last week, someone asked me, right? It's on the left shoulder blade. It's on the left shoulder blade. Now, 
So he said, if you are able to join him and reach him, do so. And that monk died after that. So Salman radiallahu anhu, he came to Medina searching for that. And he looked for those signs. He came and he brought to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam a gift of dates. The Prophet alayhi salam ate it and he gave it to the companions as well. And then the next day he brought charity and the Prophet alayhi salam refused it and he gave it to the companions. And then he came and he was waiting to see the Prophet alayhi salatu salam seal or prophet. That was the only thing left. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam was in sujood in salah and Salman is waiting. And the Prophet alayhi salatu salam received revelation that Salman is trying to see the seal of prophethood. So he salatu salam uncovered it so Salman can see it. And then after that Salman radiallahu anhu embraced Islam. So the people of the scripture, they knew that the Prophet ﷺ was coming, they were certain. Whether it was the Jews or the Christians. Now, طيب. Jameel. Are you exhausted? Huh? Have I lost you? Are you following along? Huh? Do you need a break? Yes, you do. Khalas, take a break. You have two minutes. I'm counting now. خلاص two minutes is up يا جماعة لسه تو دام شاء الله. Where is he? Where's your father? Show me which one is that thing? Which one? Which one? Ah, so what is the... Mashallah. How old is he? Five. Five. That's a big man. How much is the Quran? Surah Al-Fatiha? Six. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Lord. Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim. That's the person to learn. Allah, 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 Allah. Zayd. Okay, we're going to start, inshaAllah ta'ala. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa thana'u illah, wa salatu salam ala rasulillah. We're now coming to, we're coming closer to now to prophethood. All of what we have covered previously is prior to prophethood, before the Prophet Ali doesn't become a prophet. Now the Prophet Ali is about to come, become a prophet. 
But before we became a prophet, there was a number of things that are worth mentioning that indicated that something great is coming up, especially just before prophethood, a few years before it, and especially just before it as well, and in the same year of prophethood. Number one, it is that the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam, he وسلم, would receive different signs that indicated that prophethood. He sallallahu alayhi wa he mentioned in the hadith of Jabir ibn Samurah radiallahu anhu that inni la'arifu hajaran bi Makkah kana yusallimu alayya qabla an ub'ath inni la'arifu al-an The Prophet alayhi salatu from the rocks that were in Makkah they used to greet him before prophethood and this is one of the signs right and one of the miracles that uh, some of the miracles that occurred before prophethood and he said that I know a rock or a stone in Mecca that used to greet me before prophethood. And I know it right now. If I was to show you it, I'll be able to show it right now, he said, alayhi salatu salam. And amongst the things that the Prophet, alayhi salatu he received before prophethood, it is what was known as a ru'ya saliha or a ru'ya sadiqa, the truthful dreams. The Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he received dreams, and these dreams are important. Because these dreams, they, he will see certain things in the dream, and these things will come true in the day. And this was preparing the Prophet والسلام, for the ultimate revelation. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said the first form of revelation the Prophet والسلام, he received was a ru'ya sadiqa, the truthful dreams. And he would see that dream in real life like, you know, when the, the sun comes out in the morning, how bright it becomes, like that. That's how clear it was. Alayhi salatu salam. And also from the things that occurred before prophethood, it is that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he started to love secluding himself for worship. Hubbiba ilayhi al khala. In the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, Wa hubbiba ilayhi al uzla, wa tahannuth. She said it was made beloved to him. A tahannuth, which is to worship Allah in seclusion. Wal uzla, to seclude yourself. فَكَانَ يَخْلُو He used to seclude himself في غار حراء in the cave of Hira in Mount Hira. Mount Hira. Not Jabal al-Nur. Huh? Today when you go to Mecca, they tell you it's called Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light. That is not the actual name. The actual name of the mountain is Jabal Hira. But the common name today, people call it is Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light. Perhaps they gave it that name after prophethood because of the wahi coming down to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam in that cave, in that mountain. But it's called Jabal Hira, Mount Hira. The Prophet alayhi salam used to remain there for a number of days worshipping Allah alone. And then she says, radiallahu anha, that sometimes he would spend 10 days there. And sometimes just more than that, but not a month, under that, less than that, just under a month, he would spend in Hira. And then after spending that period of time in Hira, worshipping Allah, wa ta'ala, he would come back to his family and then he would take provisions. He wouldn't stay long. He would take provisions and then he would go back to Hira and spend a number of days there again. طيب. All of this, it's important because Allah, wa ta'ala, by these things occurring before prophethood, they're preparing the Prophet والسلام, for the ultimate revelation which is about to come. So when the Prophet ﷺ, he reached the age of 40, he was in Jabal Hira on a Monday in the month of Ramadan. And whilst he was in the mountain and in the cave, worshipping Allah Taala alone, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him. And this is when everything changed. This is when the life of the Prophet والسلام, transformed. This is the moment that changed his complete life. Jibreel alayhi salam, comes down and he grabs the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, and he says to him, Iqra, and he shakes him. And the Prophet alayhi salam, terrified, he says, Ma ana biqari, I cannot read. And then he shakes him again, holding him tight. And the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said, until it became very difficult. And then he said, Iqra, read. And the Prophet والسلام, responded, Ma ana biqari, I cannot read. And then he did the same thing a third time. He said to him, Iqra. And the Prophet والسلام, responded with the same answer. And then he said, Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil-qalam. Allama al-insana ma lay na'alam. 
And these were the first ever verses revealed to the Prophet Ali sallallahu alayhi wa read. Bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq in the name of your Lord that created. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. He created man from a blood clot. Iqra, read. Wa rabbuka al-akram and your Lord is the most noble, the most generous. Alladhi the one allama taught bil qalam with the pen. A'i he taught Idris alayhi salam to write. The first to write was Idris alayhi salam. علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. He taught man all that which he did not know. So the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام he memorizes these verses. He has just now seen this incident. He hasn't completely fathomed what had happened. The Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام was terrified, and the first instinct that he had was to run. And where did he run? He ran home to his wife Khadija, to his home. He went to her, and the first thing he said, "Zamiluni, zamiluni, dathiruni, dathiruni, cover me, cover me, cover me." And then Khadija radiyallahu anha she covers up the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام with a blanket until he calmed down. And then he said عليه الصلاة والسلام لقد خشيت على نفسي that I feared for my life. I thought I was going insane. And then Khadija radiyallahu anha she asked him, "What happened? Tell me." And then he said, "Allah has sent He tells her what happened. And then after he narrated the whole thing to her, she this great intelligent woman, how does she respond? She said, Kalla, la yukhzikallahu abada. Allah ta'ala shall never ever disgrace you. Look at the way she responded. She looked at what the Prophet ﷺ had told her. She listened to it. She understood it. She comprehended it. And she said, this man who I know, who I've known for the last many years that I've been married to, it's impossible for Allah to disgrace him. Why? Because rahim, you keep ties with the kin. and you honor the guest. and you help that the one who's in need. ala nawaib al and you help and support just causes. Now, what is Khadija radiallahu anha saying? She's saying that one who has these qualities, who has these traits, we know from the sunnah of Allah on this earth that Allah never disgraces him, never harms him, never does any evil to him. Because a person who is keeping ties with his kin, who is good to his family, this is what shows what a true good person is. Because the one who's truly good to his people, his family, right? That shows that he's a good person. The one who's good to others but not good to his family, it shows that he doesn't have good character. Your family are those who know you the best. If your family are saying that you are a great person, you have the best character and so on, then that means you're a good person and a person who has great character and all these great qualities, Allah wa will never disgrace him. Look at this great woman. Look at the way she responded. And that's why the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said, Kamula min rijali kathir. That a lot of men have become complete or in the, in the worldly sense. وَكَمُولًا مِنَ النِّسَاءِ أَرْبَعَ And in terms of women, only four became complete in a worldly sense. And he mentioned Maryam bint Imran alayhi salam, Asya imra'at Fir'aun, Khadija bint Khuwaylid, and Fatima bint Muhammad. He said that these women are the four women who became complete. So Khadija radiallahu anha, she didn't only say the right thing to the Prophet ﷺ so that he needed to hear that tie, but she also did the right thing. And she immediately took the Prophet ﷺ to her cousin, Waraqa ibn Nawfal ibn Asad. Waraqa ibn Nawfal ibn Asad was an extremely old man who had been searching for the true religion for a number of years, for a long time. And he went through all the different religions and the different scriptures. He was very well versed with the different scriptures. And he was following the religion of Ibrahim السلام, upon monotheism, he wasn't upon shirk. So he knew the Hebrew language and he knew also the scriptures of the Jews and also the Christians. And he read it. So because Khadija radiallahu anha, she knows that Waraqa is well learned, she took the Prophet to a person of knowledge. And this teacher's lesson, look, she didn't only say the right thing, but she did the right thing as well, taking him to a person of knowledge who can guide him to do the right thing. Or can, who can give him the right guidance in this time or advice. So she went to Waraqa and she said, listen to Ibn Akhik, listen to your cousin. And the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. So the Prophet alayhi salatu narrated to Waraqa what happened with Jibreel alayhi salam. And the Waraqa responded by saying, that can namus, that is the angel that Allah wa ta'ala sent to Musa and Isa. When narration says Musa only. And then he says, if I was a young man, I wish that I was a young man. So that I can stand by you and support you when your people exile you and fight against you. 
the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said, Awa mukhrijiyahum, are they going to exile me? Waraka responded by saying, no man has ever come with what you have come except that his people have exiled him and they fought against him. He said, if I was able to live long, I would grant you victory and stand by you and support you. But Waraka, he didn't live long. He was extremely elderly at the time and shortly after that encounter with the Prophet ﷺ, he actually passed away. But now the Prophet ﷺ is coming to terms with what had happened. He's coming to understand it. He's realized that this is not him losing his mind. But the Prophet ﷺ, he never had that doubt in the first place. It was just a matter of fear that made him say that. He never had a doubt that he ﷺ, is going insane. He never had that doubt. Because when you are truthful and you are always honest, you are, before you are honest to others, you are honest with yourself. And the one who's honest with himself, he knows the reality of what is going on within himself. So he وسلم, knew he wasn't losing his mind, but it is fear that made him get to that stage. طيب. Now, this incident, there's a number of lessons that can be learned from it. Number one, it is that Allah wa ta'ala he granted the Prophet alayhi salatu salam that love for seclusion before prophethood. And that is a very important point that a lot of people, they overlook in the seerah. But Allah ta'ala, the reason why the ulama, they mentioned that he made seclusion in worshipping Allah ta'ala, beloved to the Prophet alayhi salatu for a period of time, it is to prepare him spiritually for the message to spiritually cleanse him and also to cleanse his heart and to cleanse his mind from the pollution of mixing with people. Allah Taala was trying to cleanse him from all that, all these, all this interference that's the exterior, that's external, all this external interference. Allah Taala is cleansing him, purifying him for that by making that beloved to him. So that when the wahi, the revelation comes down, the Prophet is ready. And that's why it's important, ayyuhal kiram, that anyone who's in this, who's in, and any slave of Allah generally, and anyone who's in the act or the job of serving the religion of Allah ta'ala, he needs to have times that he's alone with Allah, no one else is there. It's important, it's essential for your spirituality. You need to have times that you seclude yourself with Allah, worshipping Allah ta'ala, getting closer to Allah Azzawajal, to increase your spirituality, to hold yourself accountable, to reflect on your situation, to reflect on what you have done well and things that you've done wrong so that you can rectify it and get better in your relationship with Allah and what you do. That's essential. And this is what this incident it teaches us. Also, Allah ta'ala, or the hadith of Aisha, when she talks about the seclusion, she says that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam فَيَتَحَنَّثُ الْلَيَالِي ذَوَاتِ الْعَدَدِ That the Prophet alayhi salatu salam يتحنث, used to seclude himself in worship in Ghar Hira, in the Kay, for a number of nights, a number of nights. Now this wording that she said, it has a lot of meaning behind it. Because it's teaching us, and the ulama, they say that it's teaching us that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam he wasn't extreme in anything he did. Even the seclusion, he wasn't extreme. He wouldn't abandon his responsibilities and his family and all the other things he needed to attend to. And that's important to know. That the Prophet ﷺ, even prior to prophethood, he taught us that he was balanced in everything. And that is how the Muslim is. That he's balanced in everything that he does. Whether it's ibadah, whether it is his interactions, whether it is his wealth, whatever it may be, he's balanced in everything. Like that we have made you not the middle nation, the balanced nation. That's the better translation. The balanced nation. We are balanced in everything. La ifrata wa la tafrit. We don't go to both extremes. Now. طيب. There are different types of wahi, revelation. We also benefit from this, that there are different types of revelation. The hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, it tells us that the first form of revelation the Prophet alayhi received was the truthful dreams. What are the different types of revelation? So the first, as we mentioned, is the truthful dreams. Right? The truthful dreams. And the dreams of the prophets, the messengers, is revelation of Allah. 
Because we have the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran that Ibrahim alayhi salam he saw a dream that he was commanded to slaughter his son. So that's a command from Allah. It's wahi revelation from Allah. He said to his son, Ya Bunayya, inni ara fil manami anni adbahuk, fanzur mada tara. He said, Oh my son, I see my dream that I had been commanded to slaughter you. So what do you think about that? He said, Ya Abati Falma Tu'mar. Oh my father, do as you commanded, Ismail said. This young boy who's 12 at the time, 12 years old. So my father, do as you commanded. You will find me amongst the patient. The second type of revelation, it is Al-Ilham, where Allah Ta'ala, He inspires the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam. Or Jibreel Alayhi Salam, He inspires speech into the Prophet Alayhi Salatu without coming to him or seeing him or coming to him in the form of man and so on. No. Because the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam, He said, In the Jibreel, نَفَخَ فِي قَلْبِي أَنَّهُ لَن تَمُوتَ نَفْسٌ حَتَّى تَسْتَكْمِلَ رِزْقَهَا فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَجْمِلُ فِي الطَّلَبِ He said in the hadith alayhi salatu salam that Jibreel alayhi salam he nafakha, he blew into my heart he inspired me that no soul is going to die until it completes its rizq, its provision so then he said فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ فِي اللَّهَ وَأَجْمِلُ فِي الطَّلَبِ and beautify the way you request from Allah right So that indicates that the Prophet ﷺ used to receive wahi through ilham, inspiration. The third type of wahi, and this was the, the most difficult and severest type of wahi, it is that the Prophet ﷺ he used to receive revelation like a ringing bell. He would hear like a ringing bell. He would receive revelation like that. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, in the hadith of Al-Harif radiallahu anhum, he said, Ya Rasulullah, how does the wahi come to you? And then he said, Allah said, he said, أحيانا يأتيني مثل صلصلة الجرس وهو أشده علي He said, sometimes it comes to me like the ring of a bell. And this is the severest type of revelation to me. Another narration in, of Aisha رضي الله عنها, she says that when the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام will receive wahi, right, this type of wahi, like the ring bell, when it's an extremely cold day, we'll see that the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام's face sweating due to how severe the wahi was. In another narration, it says that when the Prophet ﷺ would receive this type of wahi, that he would become extremely heavy. That he was one day leaning on one of the Sahaba. And as he was leaning on him, he received that wahi. And the Sahabi said that I felt like my leg was going to break because of how heavy the Prophet ﷺ became. Right? This was the most severe type of wahi the Prophet ﷺ used to receive. The fourth type of wahi, it is that Allah Taala He speaks directly to the Messenger ﷺ. He speaks directly to him without a middleman. Like he did to Musa alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam, it is affirmed that Allah Azza wa spoke to him directly in the Quran. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا That Allah Taala spoke to Musa directly. And the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he spoke to Allah Azza wa directly without a middleman on the night journey of Isra al-Mi'raj when he went to the heavens. Allah spoke to him directly. Right, we have that in the hadith of Isra al-Mi'raj which is authentic in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. The fifth type of wahi revelation, it is that The Prophet ﷺ, he sees Jibreel ﷺ in his actual form, like what happened in Ghar Hira. Jibreel ﷺ came in his actual form. right? And that didn't happen often, but it happened. Now, the sixth type of wahi, it is that Jibreel ﷺ, he comes in the form of a man. He comes in the form of a man. Either of a form of a man, That no one knows, like we have in the hadith of Jibreel, which is in Sahih Muslim. And sometimes he'll come in the form of some of the companions of the Prophet. And it is said that he'll often come in the form of a Sahabi known as Dihya al Kalbi. Dihya al Kalbi, radiallahu anhu. So these are the six types of form of revelation the Prophet will receive. And Allah wa ta'ala, he mentions that in the Quran, he says, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرِي أن يكلمه الله إلا وحيا أو من وراء حجاب أو يرسل رسولا فيوحي بإذنه ما يشاء إنه علي حكيم. الله says that is not وما كان لبشر is not for a human being. أن يكلمه الله that Allah عز وجل speaks to him إلا وحيا except through revelation. أي الله speaks him directly like Musa عليه السلام and the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. أو من وراء حجاب or behind a veil directly. Oh, Yurusila Rasulun, oh Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He sends to him Rasulun, a messenger, i.e., Jibreel alayhi salam, the angel, Fayuhiya bi idnihi ma yasha, and he reveals to him with the permission of Allah whatever he wishes, Allah wishes. Now, 
Jameel. So that's the different types of wahi that will also benefit from this. Okay. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, now we get to the next stage, and this is the last part we're going to conclude our lesson with, inshaAllah ta'ala. The last stage is that the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, when he received the revelation, iqra, there was a period of time where the Prophet alayhi salatu didn't receive any revelation. And the ulama, they mentioned different timings. Some of them mentioned that it was a long period of time. Some of them mentioned it was a month. Some of them mentioned it's a number of days. And what's correct is it was just a number of days. And these number of days... Allah wa ta'ala gave it to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam so that to take, give him time to take in what had happened. Right? And then Allah wa ta'ala he revealed to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam Ya ayyuhal muddathir qum fa'andhir And this is the second type of revelation that came to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. O you who's covered up. Qum, arise and warn and call to Allah wa ta'ala wa rabbaka fakabbir these verses were the verses of Surah Al-Muddathir of the Prophet ﷺ, which instructed him to now do the da'wah, to call to Allah, a da'wah to Allah, which instructed him to call to Allah Azza wa Jal. How does he call to Allah Azza wa Jal? Secretly. At the beginning, it was secret. So the Prophet ﷺ, he started with the closest people to him, of course, his household. And his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, and Khadija radiallahu anha, she embraced Islam as soon as the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he called her to an Islam. And Khadija radiallahu anha wardaha, she was the first to hear the Quran from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. These are virtues that Khadija has. She was the first to hear the Quran from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. She was the first to embrace Islam. She was the first to recite the Quran after the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. She was the first to pray and learn the wudu and the salah after the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. All these virtues were to Khadija. And her house was the first house that the Quran and Wahi came to. All these virtues are reserved for Khadija bint Khwalid radiallahu anha wa ardaha. She was the first Muslim ala al-itlaq. And then we have the, the, the people who followed her, which is Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was the cousin of the Prophet Ali Salatu, who lived in the household of the Prophet Ali Salatu. He was the first child to embrace Islam. He was 10 years old at the time. Radiallahu anhu He was the first child to have embraced Islam. And then you have the first slave or freed slave to have embraced Islam, which is Zayd ibn Haritha. Radiallahu anhu Zayd ibn Haritha was the slave of the Prophet Ali Salatu who he freed and he later on became his adopted son. And then that also got abolished later on. Zayd ibn Haritha his father and his family, the relatives, they came to Mecca seeking him to come and join them after he was freed. And then he, radiallahu anhu arda, he chose the Prophet وسلم, over his own father and his family. And his father said to him, he chose this man over us. He said that I have seen from this man that which I have not seen from any other human being. So, and he said to the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, you, are like from, you are like to me a father and an uncle. And he previously used to be called Zayd ibn Muhammad because the Prophet وسلم, adopted him. And then Allah Ta'ala abolished that where he revealed the ayah in Surah Al-Ahzab Udu'uhum li'abaihim huwa aqsatu inda Allah Call them and ascribe them to their fathers That's the most just matter in the sight of Allah Right? Now Jameel And then you have the first from the men who embrace Islam and that is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda who is the closest companion of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. He embraced Islam immediately. And the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said about him, look what he said about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He said, مَا دَعُوتُ أَحَدًا إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ إِلَّا كَانَتْ عِنْدَهُ كَبْوَةً وَتَرَدَّدَ وَنَظَرْ إِلَّا أَبَا بَكْرٍ مَعَكَمْ حِينَ دَعُوتُهُ وَلَا تَرَدَّدْ فِيهِ He said that I have not called anyone to Islam except that they had some hesitation. They said, let me think about it. Everyone, except Abu Bakr, he said. He never hesitated. He never thought about it, but rather he accepted Islam immediately when the Prophet ﷺ called him Islam. That's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. No wonder he is the great man and the best man after the Prophet ﷺ in this ummah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, some of the ulama, they say 
what is the reason that made Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that great and he surpassed everyone else, all the other companions? Al Imam Bakr ibn Abdullah al Muzani, rahimahullah tabarak wa ta'ala, he says, Wallahi, ma sabakakum Abu Bakr bi kathrati salatin, wala siyamin, wala kin bi shi'in waqara fi kalbi. He said, I swear by Allah that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't surpass you all and surpass everyone else due to a lot of prayers or a lot of fasts or a lot of righteous deeds, but it was due to something that settled in his heart and that's a certainty, and that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ is alluding to there. That Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when the Prophet ﷺ told about Islam, he immediately accepted Islam certain. He was given the name as Siddiq because of his certainty. That when the Prophet ﷺ, which we're going to find out later on, that when he went to the, the journey of Al-Isra al-Mi'raj, he went to Jerusalem in one night, and then he went to the heavens, and they came back to Mecca in the same night, and Quraysh heard about this, they were mocking and ridiculing the Prophet alayhi salatu Then they came to Abu Bakr, who hadn't heard it from the Prophet alayhi salatu yet. The Prophet sallam had not told Abu Bakr what happened. So they came to Abu Bakr and said to him, Ya Abu Bakr, have you heard what your companion is claiming now? He's claiming that he went to Jerusalem in one night. What nonsense, it takes us months to get there and he's saying that he went there in one night. And Abu Bakr, he said, if he said it, then it's the truth. 100% is the truth. And then he said that you are talking about going to Jerusalem in one night. I believe it's something greater than that, that he receives revelation from the heavens in a moment. And he's talking about going to Jerusalem. And then after that, he was given the name of Siddiq. Radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, he was one of the most honorable men, man, men amongst Quraysh. And he was extremely wealthy and was respected amongst Quraysh. And everyone looked up to him and everyone loved him. Quraysh used to say that he is one of the most beloved men amongst Quraysh. And he was one of those people that everyone was attracted to, that everyone wanted to be in his company. Extremely popular. So his Islam was a great victory for the Muslims. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't just embrace Islam and leave it at that. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was extremely knowledgeable amongst Quraysh. And the two sciences that mattered the most to Quraysh was the science of history and lineage, al-ansab. And Abu Bakr was the most knowledgeable amongst Quraysh regarding those two sciences. That's why they respected him a lot, so much, because of his knowledge of that. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu embraced Islam. After he embraced Islam, he felt responsible that I need to convey this message of Islam to others. So what did he do? He went and he started to call Islam in secrecy. He went to those that he knew had a strong moral compass and he called them to Allah wa ta'ala. He came back with Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan became Muslim through Abu Bakr. And Uthman ibn Affan was 34 years old at the time. 34. How old was Abu Bakr at the time? Huh? 38. He was two years younger than the Prophet ﷺ. Uthman radiallahu anhu was 34 when he embraced Islam. And then he also gave da'wah to Abdurrahman ibn Awf, who was 30 at the time he embraced Islam. Also he gave da'wah to Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu, who was 17 when he embraced Islam. And he also gave da'wah to Az-Zubair ibn Awwam radiyallahu anhu who was 12 when he embraced Islam. And he also gave da'wah to Talha ibn Ubaidillah who was 13 when he embraced Islam. All of these five men that became Muslim through Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu, they are amongst the ten that are from his paradise. Look of the hasanat of Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu. Five of the ten that are from his paradise became Muslim through him radiyallahu anhu arda. Sabbaq lil khayr. He surpassed everyone when he came to goodness. Right? Now, طيب. so now people were embracing Islam in different groups. There was a first group which we just mentioned Abu Bakr, Khadija, Ali, Zaid, Radiallahu Anhu, Uthman, Abdurrahman, Talha, Zubair, and Sa'd ibn Abbaqas, and so on. And then there was a second group, and amongst them was Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, who was almost also amongst the Ten Promised Paradise. Abu Salama, radiallahu anhu, who is the, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam's brother from breastfeeding. You have Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam, who we're going to find out in the next lesson, who his home was the hub of the da'wah. Al-Arqam ibn, Ab, ibn Abi Al-Arqam al-Makhzumi. You have Uthman ibn Mad'un al-Jumuhi. And many others, Ubaidah ibn al-Hadith ibn Abdul Muttalib, who is a cousin of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, from his uncle al-Hadith, who was the eldest children of 
عبد المطلب الحارث ابن عبد المطلب his son عبيدة ابن الحارث who was martyred in the battle of Badr and you have Saeed ibn Zayd who's from the ten promised paradise and his wife Fatima bint al-Khattab who's a sister of Umar ibn Khattab and many others who embrace Islam Asma bint Abi Bakr Aisha bint Abi Bakr Khabbab bin Arat and so on so different groups were embracing Islam after that and this was all in secrecy None of it was public. Quraysh had no idea at this time. The stage of the da'wah being secret was three years. And the Prophet ﷺ, according to the Islam in secret, there was wisdom behind it because the Muslims, they are weak. They need Islam to grow gradually before it can become public. It took three years before Allah commanded the Prophet ﷺ to call publicly. Also, it also teaches us that the Prophet والسلام, he did not start where perhaps a lot of young people will start their da'wah with. He وسلم, was told to call to Tawheed, to worship Allah alone. A lot of people, young people today, if they are told that, they will go perhaps Mecca, it's filled with idols, destroy the idols immediately. But the Prophet والسلام, never did that. He never destroyed the idols until almost two decades after the da'wah. Two decades. But during those two decades, what was, what was he doing? He saw Islam was destroying the idols in the hearts of the believers, in the hearts of the people. Once those idols were destroyed in their hearts, the idols in the Kaaba, when he came to Fatih Mecca, he destroyed it and nobody objected. Nobody had any attachment to it. Nowadays, the idols that we need to, we need to destroy from the hearts of the people today, it's not Lat and Uzza and Hubal, which Quraysh had. We have other idols that we need to destroy from the hearts of the people today. In the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. Which is the idols of ideology. These isms, liberalism, secularism, feminism, ism, ism, ism. All these isms which lead to shirk and kufr. That these are the idols that we need to remove from the hearts of the people today. In the way the Prophet ﷺ did so. By teaching them that Islam is, sum is complete submission to Allah. And surrendering to Allah, to the will of Allah, and every other idea that goes against what Allah has said, and the Prophet ﷺ has said, is unacceptable. And if you adopt it and you believe it's better than Islam, it takes you out of Islam. It's instead the matter of Tawheed and the greatness of Allah, and the love of Allah, and the might of Allah, and the names of attributes of Allah in the hearts of the people. It's a matter of teaching the people the Lord that they are worshipping. Because when the Prophet ﷺ did that for 13 years, when he got to Mecca, then that is when the Amr and Nahi came down. Do this and don't do that. And when these prohibitions and commands came down, the Sahaba instantly did it. Instantly. Not but, not if. What if? I feel this. La, never happened. You don't find a single narration. Why? Because the hearts were ready. The hearts need to be nurtured. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. With Tawheed, with the oneness of Allah, teaching the people shirk and the shirk that they need to abstain from, teaching the people innovations, teaching the people all these sins that are going to destroy their hearts and lead them to doom and also disbelief if they don't do anything about it. The Prophet ﷺ, he did that and he taught us that this is, this is the methodology of calling to Allah. This, that's what the da'i, the one who calls to Allah must prioritize. He must teach people about Allah Azza wa Jal. That, was, that is what every single prophet and messenger did. Quraysh, they knew Tawheed and Shirk better than a lot of Muslims today. Because when the Prophet ﷺ said to them, قُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ تُفْلِحُوا سَيْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ You'll be successful. Quraysh knew that it, it wasn't just a statement that they had to utter, but it had conditions and it necessitates certain things that they must do. And they have to give up worshipping their idols. And they have to give up their ways of jahiliyyah. And they have to submit to the will of Allah. And they have to accept it with certainty. And they have to love Allah more than everything else. And they have to give up all the shahawat and desires that go against what Allah has commanded. And they have to follow the example of the Prophet Sallallahu They knew all of this. And that's why they were unwilling to accept it. And you ask a Muslim today, what does La ilaha illallah mean? He says La ilaha illallah and he's doing everything that contradicts La ilaha illallah. Ya jama'a, ma lakum kayfa tahkumun? Look at the jahil, the ignorance. Abu Lahab knew Tawheed better than some Muslims today. Because when the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he called to Allah publicly, Abu Lahab rejected it in secret and in public because he knew he had to give up everything that he was doing. 
They said, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهَ وَاحِدَ إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ Did he make the gods one god? This is a strange matter, they said. They knew that they, knew that they had to give up Allah to Al-Uzza and Hubal. They knew that they had to give up sacrificing for these idols. They knew that they had to give up the practices of Jahiliyyah, which were the riba of Jahiliyyah, oppressing the women. That they had to give up their arrogance and their jabarut. They knew all of that. And that's precisely what Tawheed has come to solve and to correct. It corrects the nufus, the souls, and the character. You find that Allah wa ta'ala, every time he mentions in the Quran, character, and the way a Muslim should behave, and the way he should conduct himself, and what he should do, all the time Allah mentions after it, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, because there's a direct link between the way you behave and what you do, and the belief in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Quraysh did not believe in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. That's why they did everything. They did whatever they wished. They didn't believe they'll be resurrected and held accountable. Allah mentions that constantly in the Quran. They will say, أَإِذَا مِتْنَا وَكُنَّا تُرَابًا When we die and we become dust, are we going to be resurrected? That's what they were saying to the Prophet ﷺ. And because they didn't believe Yom Al-Qiyamah, they did as they wished. They oppressed whoever they wished. They engaged all sorts of filth and evil because they did not believe there's any consequences. The Muslim, because the aqeedah teaches him, he's going to stand in front of a Yom Al- Allah, Yom Al-Qiyamah. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The day that people are going to stand in front of Allah, the Lord of the Universe. That day Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala kullu sagheeratin wa kabiratin he's going to ask you about it. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum they were nurtured upon that to the extent that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhum when he's on his deathbed you know what he said? He said that I have nominated Umar radiyallahu anhum to be the Khalifa after me. That's not the point. You know what he said after that? And I know what I'm going to say to Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala when he questions me about it. He prepared an answer before he was even asked. The Prophet ﷺ nurtured them upon that. Everything they did, they thought about it twice. They had an answer prepared for Yom Al-Qiyamah, they question about why they have done that. That's the aqeedah the Prophet ﷺ nurtured them upon. That Allah is your priority in everything and everything you do. So we ask Allah ta'ala to benefit us all to hurt. We ask Allah to protect us from everything that negates our tawheed. We ask Allah to keep us steadfast upon his religion. We ask Allah to make us from those who follow the guidance of the Prophet. We ask Allah to forgive our sins. We ask Allah to have mercy upon us. And we ask Allah to accept our deeds and to grant us sincerity in our statements and actions. Any questions? No. Any questions? Like the question was that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was calling to Islam, that when people embrace Islam, after they take their shahad and they embrace Islam, he will say to them that you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and so on. He will tell them certain things, certain guidelines that they should abide by. So the question was that why do we, do we not do that when someone embraces Islam today? The answer simply is that we do, but we do it in a gradual way. Because Allah Taala did not reveal all the ahkam at once. The Qur'an is revealed over 23 years. It wasn't revealed at once. We recited in Salat al-Isha, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدًا The disbelievers, they said to the Prophet ﷺ, if only the Qur'an was revealed to him all at once, why was it revealed gradually over 23 years? Then Allah said, كَذَلِكَ We revealed it like that, لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادِكَ To make your heart firm, so that it can be firm in your heart, and also the companions that they can accept and adopt and act upon it gradually. So the Akam was revealed gradually over time, and that's the same thing when someone embraces Islam. We don't say to them, you have to do everything at once. Now we prioritize everything, it's gradual. They start with the most important.